Coming up in this week in computer hardware, we talk iPhone 7, AirPods, benchmarks for AMD's Zen CPU, new PlayStation smartwatches, Sony's 23 megapixel phone camera, and Logitech's pop home switch. All that and more coming up next on Twitch. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twitch. Bandwidth for Twitch is provided by Cashfly at C A C A G F L Y dot com. This is Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, episode 380, recorded September 8th, 2016. How about that iPhone 7, people? This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by Tracker. Tracker makes losing things a thing of the past. Pair Tracker to your smartphone, attach it to any item, and find its precise location with a tap of a button. Visit thetracker.com right now and enter promo code TWITCH for 30% off your entire order. And buy Automatic, a small adapter that turns your clunker into a smarter, connected car. For more information on their brand new Automatic Pro adapter, visit automatic.com slash twit and enter the limited time offer code TWIT for $20 off the new device. Welcome to Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, a Twitch weekly show that aims to bring you the most useful, most informative, most engaging, and yes, most reliable commentary, insight, benchmarking, analysis, and buying advice on computer and mobile hardware and ZOMG people. There is a lot. It's like CES levels of news uh, this week between the <laughs> tail end of the... It's crazy, right? Between the tail end of IFA, which is the German CES, uh, the Apple announcement, the PlayStation announcement, um, and then, of course, uh, some interesting news coming up with uh, some ideas on what the AMD Zen performance is going to be. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, and some sundry minor hardware announcements that fell during this time, much to the misfortune of various PR people everywhere, because, you know... Oh, my goodness. Between PlayStation going 4K and Apple dropping the headphone jack and putting some really interesting cameras in the new iPhone 7. So much going on. Uh, Apple iPhone 7. Yes, the headphone jack is gone. We'll get into that in a minute. But uh, uh, the biggest thing is is really interesting new uh, processor, some really interesting new uh, camera. Two, two cameras in the Plus um, which allows them to put uh, a wide-angle lens and a telephoto lens. And when I say telephoto, we're not talking about, you know, 1,000 millimeters, but uh, a 2X lens. So they essentially have a, a wide-X lens. And then if you look at the demo on Apple's website, you know, it kind of goes from like, okay, there's a person and there's a person. Uh, and then it'll go up to digital, uh, uh, like up to a 10X, 10X digital zoom. I generally despise digital zoom because traditionally digital zoom uh, makes the pixels bigger and your photo mm -hmm. starts to look atrocious. Um, but, uh, you know, one of the big things that came out of Apple's uh, presentation yesterday um, was their discussion of their, what apparently is the most fabulous, uh, uh, you know, I don't want to call it a DSP because, you know, they were trying to make it sound like it's somewhat slightly more complicated than the average GPU this day, uh, these days, but... Um, uh, you know, they're, they're built in their custom uh, image processor that they're putting into the iPhone 7. So, um, boy, oh, boy. Um, <laughs> and that's not even getting into, oh, yeah, there's the Watch Series 2. Uh, and Nintendo is dropping the first Mario game. Uh, you know, you can play it with one hand, which just <laughs> sounds so rude every time I say it out loud. It does, yeah. Um, they're dropping it first on iOS, so I assume a check was cut because uh, it's it's going to show up. Uh, uh, Super Mario Run is going to show up on iOS, and it's going to show up on Android. Uh, Pokemon Go is coming to the to the watch. Um, you know, uh, man. So let me dial back um, my franticness for a moment. So you know, the uh, the uh, uh, twelve megapixel camera. Optical image stabilization on board. Um, you know, they got the aperture down to f1.8, um, which means it's going to be a fantastic uh, dark environment phone. They basically, they went with a 12 megapixel sensor. Uh, bigger pixels means capturing more light. That's part of the reason why it's behaving, uh, you know, like a, a decent uh, camera lens. Uh, six element lens. Um, Apple says the, the new sensor is 60% faster and consumes 30% less energy or is 30% more energy efficient uh, than the sensor on the 6S. The 7 mm -hmm. Plus, as I mentioned, it's a second 12 megapixel camera. So it's essentially a 28 millimeter lens and a 56 millimeter uh, telephoto lens. 
Now, obviously, we wouldn't really consider a, a 56 millimeter lens telephoto, but in the case of your phone, it'll do. Um, you know, the image signal processor is, I'm really curious to see what that does with the digital zoom. I'm really curious that, you know, they're basically saying uh, they can process, they, they went through this detailed explanation of all the awesomeness that is going on in terms of, you know, focusing and color balancing and a wider color gamut. And, you know, they never really said high dynamic range, but they certainly implied the, you know, that they were using the latest cinematic technologies inside of their uh, quad LED true tone flash, which is apparently 50% brighter than the flash on the 6S. So between the fact that they have now the stupid bright flash, uh, which is actually very smart uh, and a f you know, fairly low aperture, I'm really curious to see what low light or, you know, bar photography, portrait photography, the, the picture of the baby blowing out its first birthday candle. Um, <laughs> You know, and then uh, the 7 Plus is going to be getting uh, their new depth of field effect, which takes advantage of the DSP and the dual cameras to try to create sort of bokeh uh, and uh, to kind of synthesize the idea of like, you know, okay, I'm a, I'm a photographer. I want super low depth of field so that my person is in the frame and the stuff behind them is fuzzy and that looks really mm -hmm. cool and bokeh is really cool. And uh, they're going to simulate that uh, with a software update um, on the Plus. Um, stereo speakers for the first time, uh, and not stereo speakers on the bottom, but if you hold the, the phone in landscape mode, there's a stereo speaker to the left and a stereo speaker to the right, apparently twice as loud as the 6S. A um, lot going on. Uh, and that's yeah. not even getting into the processor, which um, the A10 Fusion processor, mm -hmm. uh, four cores, Two or 40% faster than the A9 uh, that came in the 6S, uh, which are apparently twice as fast as the A8 processor in my iPhone 6. And then they have two additional cores uh, that use, quote, one-fifth the battery life. So it will assign different activities to different cores depending on what you're doing. Um, you know, bumping graphics performance for gaming. Uh, you know, the... The battery life claims were compelling, if fantastically vague. Um, they said it'll give you two more hours than a 6S, one hour more than a 6S Plus. And they're laying a lot of that at the feet of the fact that they could put a larger battery inside of it, in part because of the elimination of the headphone jack and rearranging uh, the innards. Right. Uh, of the iPhone 7. Oh, and I haven't even gotten into the fact that they now have uh, the home button is now solid state. Uh, you know, it's got their taptic system built into it, so it'll, you know, be buzzy, reacty, vibration-y. Um, I, I love that terminology for that. Uh, solid state. Yeah, I, I had a very interesting kind of 70s flashback. I mean, having sent out the picture <laughs> of all the CB radios a couple of weeks ago and the big you know, fun, pink fun fur line display case. Um, yeah. You know, half of those probably had solid state written on them. And if you're not old enough to remember, or if you haven't spent a lot of time with vintage 70s and 60s electronics, solid state was when a company was trying to explain that there's no tubes in here. There's nothing that needs to be replaced. It's all, you know, transistors and resistors and capacitors and, and now, of course, integrated circuits or, in this case, uh, unbelievably complicated and awesome home buttons. Um, a really interesting article, uh, uh, you know, uh, John Pikowski, and if I'm not saying his name correctly, I would like to apologize because the dude's a, a really good writer. Um, he had some pretty amazing access to what I will affectionately call key people inside of Apple. Uh, he wrote like a, a massive screed on sort of what's going on with the elimination of the headphone jack. And if you scroll down, uh, you'll see sort of a headphone jack in an iPhone. And they, you know, they just, they, they, they got access to a whole bunch of people. Uh, and, you know, as Ryan and I point out, this is, this is not the first phone to eliminate the headphone jack. There's a USB-C, uh, mm. you know, headphone jackish kind of phone that you can't buy because it's only available in China. Uh, obviously, the, the new Moto X is dumping the headphone jack. That happened a few weeks ago. But um, the, uh, uh, this article kind of goes through the whole process of the engineering decisions that led to the, 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 we can do all of these things if we get rid of the headphone jack. Um, it's an interesting read if you really want to geek out. And, uh, what you just, f uh, saw flashing by there, uh, was the, uh, the AirPods. So the iPhone 7 is going to ship with, uh, lightning ear pods, i.e. traditional crappy, uh, 
uh, uh, you know, in-ear monitors from Apple just with a lightning connector. And those are their super awesome new uh, AirPods. I hope these sound better than, uh, than, than the traditional Apple earbuds, right? Um, from an engineering standpoint, mm. Um, I am, I am nervous, right? Because this is one of those things, for example, Apple, you know, if, if you've, if you are, if you have spent quality time with Apple products over the last decade, you may have noticed Apple kind of continually tries to redefine the mouse and they usually do it in a way that makes it less useful and more complicated. Yep. Few emails, uh, or tweets at Patrick Norton, at Ryan Shrout discussing how we simply just don't have the appropriate fingers and, or, you know, hand eye coordination to make these advanced mice operate. But more often than not, I run into people who hate them to death and, and move away from them. So I say that because, you know, if, if you scroll down on the apple.com slash AirPods webpage, you know, you, you have this wonderful side shot of a human with the AirPods stuffed into the side of their ear, uh, and the long, long, oh, that's the case. Um, so these are, these are completely wireless you charge them by putting them in the case and you'll notice there's a really long stick hanging off that so you bury the ear pod in your ear i'm assuming it's a yank on your your earlobe and twist that thing into place because i really at 159 dollars a pair do not want them to fall out and bounce down the street and get stepped on by the you know whoever's behind me uh you know or get lost uh on the ferry or or wherever you are bounce down to a drain while you're jogging that sounds right? awful but, it sounds awful, right? <laughs> but it's uh, one of the things I liked about that 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 BuzzFeed article that uh, Pikowski put together is is he covered a bunch of stuff that they did not they're not really revealing on the web page at least as of yesterday or, or last night uh, and they didn't discuss in the uh, event. So the big thing they were like five hours, five hours of battery life, which to me is not a lot. Um, no, and I may be an extreme user, um, but the case will enable 24 hours of charging. What they didn't talk about was the recharge time. So according to Pukowski's article, when you put the ear, you know, you, the ear pods, the air buds, excuse me, the air pods, so many clever names. The AirPods magnetically snap into place in the case and start charging. So in 15 minutes, you'll get a three-hour charge out of them. So you're not going to have to, like, carry two sets of AirPods if you're flying cross-country. Although, if right. you'll notice in that, that shot of the side of the person, um, there's a vent on the back of the phone, which always makes me think to, you know, they may be doing that to enhance the sort of sound staging and the audio effects. They may be doing that to do some of the unbelievably sophisticated stuff they're doing inside of there. And I say sophisticated stuff because... Um, they have, they're using the W1 processors they built for that, which is essentially, uh, you know, Bluetooth, uh, you know, the chip uh, is doing uh, Bluetooth wireless. They're claiming it's going to improve sound. Obviously, it's, you know, it's going to be the digital analog converter, the amplifier for the speaker. Um, and then they're actually doing beam forming on the microphones um, to improve uh uh, to improve uh, the microphone performance. Um, a voice accelerometer recognizes when you're speaking and works with a pair of beamforming microphones to filter out external noise and focus on the sound of your voice. Um, there's basically infrared optical sensors to know that when they're stuffed into your ears so they stop when you pull them out and save battery life uh, or start playing. Um, you know, the, uh, oh, here it is. I, I couldn't find it yesterday, but 15 minutes of charging equals three hours of battery life. Um, you know, I, I hope they sound good because they're $159. Um, and yeah. they're obviously, you know, kind of Apple's, you know, you could say Apple's like, you know, well, we really needed to eliminate that big old airfield, air-filled headphone jack so we could finally get IP67. Except, you know, Samsung did that uh, with the Galaxy S5 years ago. So it's not like IP67. Uh, which sounds really impressive, like it's mil spec, right? Well, it basically means it's dust proof and that you can drop it in water, uh, you know, one meter for up to 30 minutes uh, without ruining the device. Um, you know, one of the big questions we were talking about yesterday uh, is the fact that you can't use a lightning adapter. By the way, there's a lightning to earphone jack, 3.5 millimeter jack that's going to be in the box, which I think is a very wise that's nice. move. For, yeah, replacing yeah, so that. Yeah, if they $9. didn't do that, oof. I don't know if they're doing analog over the lightning jack or if the DAC is inside of the lightning jack. I'll probably buy one and cut it open as soon as they're available just because I'm me. Um, yeah. Belkin, uh, props to Belkin and thanks to Mac Rumors for the heads up on this. Uh, Belkin is going to have a lightning audio adapter that enables simultaneous listening and charging. Um, and, you know, maybe this doesn't sound compelling to you, but it sounds freaking awesome to me. Uh, the Lightning Audio Plus Charge Rockstar for the iPhone 7 and 7 Plus uh, is going to be uh, $40. So, you know, ouch. Hate, uh, hate on the flip that it side, exists. 
you hate that it exists, but hey, um, you know, if you want to listen uh, and you don't want to pay $159 for AirPods, or by the way, that W1 processor that enables the AirPods is going to be available in Beats headphones, big shock there. Um, you know, they will still work with other brands of Bluetooth headphones, which is a positive thing. Um, I'm curious. I'm really curious to hear the AirPods. I will not have much of an opinion on them until I hear them and find out whether or not they fall out of my ears because that was my, my big issue uh, along with the atrocious sound quality with the, with the uh, earbuds that uh, Apple puts in the box with the iPhones. Um, man, Apple Watch Series 2. Are you excited about all the watches that came out between IFA um, and the Watch Series 2? I don't know, right? So I still am using a Pebble Time. Um, I, I used Android Watch before that. I kind of decided that I'm going to try the Apple Watch this time. I'm going to buy the cheapest version of the Series 2 uh, that they announced and give that a shot because I've never actually used uh, one of the Apple Watches before, uh, right. more than just like demoing it at, a, at an event or something like that. Sure. Um, I... I don't know. They still don't, to me, don't do anything that's like super compelling that I think I would recommend a lot of people get. What I am to the point of is now the the Pebble that I have doesn't have the functionality with the iPhone that it did with the Android devices that I had before. Um, and so I'm kind of just like, maybe maybe I'm missing out on the on the train here uh, sure. uh, of of the wearable devices because I'm using one mm -hmm. on an ecosystem that isn't really adaptable to other external devices, right? So let's give the Apple right. one a try. It's stupid expensive. You know, I think the the ba the cheapest one I can get, you know, in the larger size is three hundred ninety nine dollars, um, which is which is pricey for sure. Um, but you know, they, you know, they did a couple of things like the built in GPS change, the the waterproofness yeah. change, and uh, the, the a, thousand nit screen. Yeah, that the the thousand nit screen was a really, really, really big deal to me, right? That's twice as bright as the original uh, Apple Watch. I mean, the mm -hmm. the biggest challenge for the Apple Watch is waiting for Watch OS three, which should make the the watch usable. Uh, I'm I'm right. not a huge fan of the current watch operating system, um, so I'm okay. very excited to see the you know it seems like a lot of the issues and uh, and performance improvements will be found in Watch OS three, right? So yeah, fifty percent faster on the processor. The double brightness on the screen is a big deal. Um, you know, I was kind of laughing, um, uh, you know, at their description of the 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 fifty meter um, water resistant. Water resistance 50 meters, which is one of the most awkward sentences I've ever seen uh, on a website or in a press uh, uh, a, a press release. But, you know, it's also really hard to say, well, you know, the Apple Watch Series 2 is, you know, horology ISO standard 22810 colon 2010, which nobody knows about unless you're a watch nerd. Uh, yep. it, but it basically means you can swim uh, in mm -hmm. a pool or the ocean. Um, but, quote... Uh, scuba diving, water skiing, or other activities involving high-velocity water or submerging, submerging below shallow depth uh, is not acceptable. So um, the big deal, though, is between the GPS, which will allow you to do GPS data tracking or, or you know, movement data tracking without uh, having to carry your iPhone with you, which is a big deal for people I know who are serious fitness enthusiasts, um, and the fact that it will now, you know, count your laps, count your strokes when you're swimming and won't disintegrate upon contact with water is, is a big deal. Uh, dual core processor is nice. Uh, what they're now calling the Apple Watch Series One, which is the old Apple Watch, will get uh, the better uh, uh, graphics and processor performance, which I think will be nice. Um, yeah, it was crazy at IFA. Um, you know, at IFA there were a whole bunch of watch announcements. Um, you know, the uh, well, we'll talk about those in a couple minutes. But uh, um, yeah, it was interesting. Um, you know, when you're thinking about, you know, Apple's approach, uh, where they're like, you know, we're advancing the species. They, they said they're, it was courage. Apple had the courage to eliminate the headphone jack, uh, which apparently means Motorola had the courage and a Chinese cell phone company you don't know had the courage. Um, you know, but Apple certainly is willing to, to walk away from the headphone jack. Uh, I'm sure we're going to see a lot fewer headphone jacks, uh, you know, next year. Um, but at the same time that they were doing that, uh, LG dropped one of the, what I think is one of the most exciting Android phones I've heard of in a while, obviously because I'm an audio geek. Um, but they took uh, a nice write-up by uh, Chris Welch on The Verge. Um, you know, they, they've they created, uh, it's going to be NuGet-powered. Um, you know, it's going to be sort of a premier... Uh, 
uh, uh, cell phone, you know, kind of right up there with the G5, um, you know, uh, you know, mill standard 810G drop and shock resistance, which means it shouldn't disintegrate the first time you drop it. Uh, I'm not going to say anything about the second, uh, you know, QHD <laughs> 5.7 inch display. So it's, you know, right on the borderline of being a phablet. But what's, uh, you know, Snapdragon 820 processor, four gigs of RAM, 64 gigabytes of storage uh, and support for up to two terabyte micro SD cards. Um, you know, so what's kind of crazy about this is they put a, a pretty sophisticated uh, ESS Saber DAC inside of it. And ESS Saber DACs are audiophile quality. They're fantastic digital analog converters. Um, AudioQuest uses them. A whole bunch of other companies use them inside of really beautiful gear to uh, feed audio to your headphones. So assuming they, you know, they, 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 they you know, a, a, the, the quad DAC essentially means they're splitting multiple DACs across the frequencies. Um, um, you know, the, uh, it looks like they probably have a decent headphone amp inside of there, 72 stage volume control, um, you know, support for, you know, lossless audio formats. I don't see anything on whether or not they're supporting HD on there. Um, you know, but they did that, uh, you know, and, uh, and a decent, uh, uh, 16 megapixel, you know, F1.8 again, the, the number we heard in the, the Apple, uh, iPhone seven. Um, right. You know, and uh, a lot of work on uh, video capture, um, Qualcomm Steady Record 2.0, which basically takes information from the gyroscope to help do image stabilization. Um, I'm really curious to see this. Um, I don't think it's going to be cheap. <laughs> I don't think there's any pricing available on it yet. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it's a very, you know, uh, you know, you could argue that, that uh, it is much harder um, it is much harder uh, for an Android phone company to make money uh, than it is for Apple to make money. But I thought it was interesting oh, sure. to see them be like, hey, we're going to make a fantastic phone that's going to make your headphones sound amazing. Uh, and we're not going to you know, make you buy an extra $100 back for that. We're not going to do a bunch of crazy stuff. Uh, 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 you know, uh, it's interesting, right? You know, hi-fi recording, uh, some decent audio, like 24-bit audio recording apparently. A very different... Uh, very different uh, uh, device, a very different series of decisions on mm. that device. Um, man, Sony uh, announced an IFA, uh, the Xperia XZ, um, which is kind of crazy in that they put a 23 megapixel camera inside of it, five axis image stabilization, um, you know, uh, like so many things, Android, it's USB type C, uh, but they went with a 1080p screen, which I think is a great decision for battery life. Uh, 1080p 5.2 inch screen, again, another Snapdragon 820 processor. Um, uh, you know, you can kind of pre register for news on that. And they did a compact version of it, um, that has a 4.6 inch 720p screen. So significantly smaller, um, but with the same 23 megapixel camera and fingerprint sensor. And given the work Sony's been doing uh, with their high-end image sensors, yeah, I'm assuming the, the people that make the image sensors for Sony's cameras are helping out the phone people. Um, that has the potential to be an utterly ridiculous uh, uh, camera. I don't know. I'm, I'm very curious to see what, what images from all these phones look like uh, in the hands of real people. Um, I hmm. mentioned USB Type C. USB Type C to HDMI is coming soon. Uh, Jeremy wrote that up for PCPer.com. Uh, but essentially, uh, uh, you know, the HDMI licensing group uh, is going to allow a, a simple, easy to use, thank you, uh, USB Type C to HDMI cable uh, for all of you out there uh, who are not Robert Heron who want to connect your phone to HDTV. <laughs> it's not a long list. Um, <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. Uh, you know, but there are, there are certainly, uh, some people out there that do this, uh, or want to do this. And then, uh, uh, it looks like Nexuses are dead. And, uh, Boy Genius Report did an article on this, um, um, uh, along with lots and lots of other places, but apparently the Nexus phones are now going to be Pixel phones. And uh, we'll have a new version of Android that nobody else has, Android 7.1. So we don't really know much of anything huh. about that. Um, you I know, like the Nexus I, brand. Yeah, I think it's... Uh, man, um, 
you know, I'm very, 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 very curious because the Nexus, you know, I know a lot of people who are incredibly loyal to the Nexus brand, not just because the hardware has often been a value, um, you know, an incredible value for what you pay for it, but because it's a pure Android experience and, uh, Everybody wants to cruft up Android and make their phone cooler. Uh, and more often than not, they make their phone, you know, less fast and, and more difficult to function and more difficult to transfer off of. But um, I think it's going to be uh, it's going to be interesting to see what the new Pixel phones look like. So we wait with <laughs> bated breath. Indeed. Oh my goodness! So much more to talk about. Some of which even involves computer hardware, people. But right now, though, we want to thank our friends over at Tracker. This episode of this week in computer hardware is brought to you by Tracker. Smart cars, smartphones, smart homes. Technology is making everything smart. Even, ladies and gentlemen, switches and light bulbs. But losing your possessions can make even smart people feel less than smart. Tracker makes losing things a thing of the past. It's really cool, right? Uh, it's it's the size of a you know a little bigger than a quarter. Uh, it makes it easy to locate your misplaced keys or maybe your spouse's misplaced keys, wallets, backpacks, bicycles, computers, even pets. You basically attach the tracker. Uh, well, first you pair the tracker to your smartphone, right? If you can press a button, you can, you, you know, you can pair the tracker. Your phone can track up to 10 devices at once. Uh, tracker is Bluetooth LE, so the battery should last up to a year. Uh, you can customize, this is one of my favorite parts, uh, two-way separation alerts so that if you walk away from your keys or you walk away from your backpack or perhaps someone tries to make your backpack walk away from you, it'll set off an alarm and you can immediately realize that something's missing, go into panic mode and find it. Uh, if you lose your phone, you know, press the tracker button, say, on your keychain, and your phone's going to ring even if it's on silent. Having, uh, I, I work with an individual that constantly misplaces their phone and handed them a tracker, and now they click and the phone sings out. It's pretty smart. Uh, there's over a million, 1.5 million devices uh, Tracker has out there in the world. That means they've got the largest crowd GPS network in the world. So your lost item can show up on a map even if it's miles away. The Tracker app records your lost item's last location. And when another Tracker user comes within 100 foot range of your item, you'll receive a GPS update of your item's location. Tracker Alice works with the Tracker Bravo or third-party Bluetooth tracker to pinpoint your items on a customizable floor plan of your home. Just ask Tracker Atlas where your item is and you will instantly get an answer. There's no need to search. If you find yourself compelled by this, if you are tired of losing things, look at all those trackers. Go to thetrackr.com and never lose your possessions again. Plus, just for our audience, if you enter in the promo code TWITCH, that's T-W-I-C-H, you'll get 30% off your entire order. That's T-H-E-T-R-A-C-K-R.com, promo code TWITCH, and get 30% off your entire tracker order. That is a big deal, people. And uh, we want to thank tracker for their support of this week in computer hardware oh my goodness uh new playstations new xboxes now new playstations yep. uh crazily enough uh you know not long after uh apple's event ended uh uh sony fired up their events um like the xbox one uh, the playstation slim is the same hardware in a smaller cheaper package um, you know, the One S added HDR, 4K Blu-ray, 4K streaming video, up to two terabyte hard drives. Uh, in this case, the Slim is uh, slimmer. <laughs> you know, I mean, I hate to sound silly when I say that, but uh, it's, uh, it's pretty cool, actually. Um, if you are looking to replace your PlayStation or if you've been on the fence with a PlayStation 4, um, you know, the, you know, the other thing that they not only is it smaller, but apparently more energy efficient, uh, 30% smaller, um, power consumption is down 28%. So right. obviously this is one of those classic mid console lifestyle, you know, parts count reduction, shrinkification kind of thing. Um, yep. but the big deal is probably the PlayStation four, uh, pro, um, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, you know, which, uh, is getting the 4k gaming on. They claim they've doubled, the GPU uh, performance, and I was I was thinking of you when I was reading this yesterday, um, uh, because all I could think was, okay, you know, Sony's quote games that already look extraordinary on PS4 will look richer in more detail thanks to more powerful GPU and a faster CPU at the heart of PlayStation 4. And all I could think is like I'm stoked about 4K and, and high dynamic range, 
Yeah. But I can't believe they actually, I, I couldn't believe that the processor inside the PlayStation, like just doubling it didn't seem like it would be enough to do decent 4K gaming. <laughs> no, no, it's absolutely not, right? So I think the GPU performance is like 2.3X on this. The CPU performance right. is essentially the same. Uh, this will be out in November, I think, so relatively soon. Yes. Um, yeah, Slim comes out September 15. It's $299. Okay. Uh, yeah, and the Pro is going to beat Project Scorpio out by probably by six months. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's yeah. $399 on November 10th, just in time for uh, Black yeah. Friday. Um, now, what's, what's interesting is that it is, so it's it's 4.2 teraflops or so, mm -hmm. which is essentially identical to uh, like the Polaris 11 GPU, uh, that's I think the RX 460 is the model branding for that. Um, and that's kind of what AMD has has stated before as like one of the key inflection points for GPU performance. So it's not a right. not it's not a coincidence that Sony's releasing at that. And and you're right, 4K gaming at that performance is not. You'll be able to do native 4K gaming with some simplistic gaming and animation and right. graphics, uh, but you're not going to do you know Tomb Raider, Rise of the Tomb Raider, or GTA 5 level graphics at 4K. I mean, hell, we we have we struggle to do that on the PC with GTX 1080s uh, still today. So what you're going to see, you know, instead is rendering at 1080p and upscaling it to 4K uh, to output to your display, uh, which is fine. I mean, and you already see some of the consoles do that, right? You know, uh, re rendering at slightly lower than 1080p on the PS4 and Xbox One today and upscaling it to 1080p. And when you're doing 1080p to 4K, it's, it's you know, simple multiplication right. of four there. So it's, it's, it's pretty easy to do, uh, but it will do like the 4K video streaming um, so Netflix and that type of stuff. One interesting thing, and I did just look this up to be sure, uh, this does not have a 4K Blu-ray player built into it. Really? The Pro does not? The Pro does not. Wow. But the Xbox One S that does. came out like a month ago does. And so you assume Scorpio will have one, obviously, as well. And the Xbox One S sells for $299 today uh, for the 2-terabyte model. And this will be $399 uh, when it launches in November. It's it's really surprising to me that Sony would not include uh, a, a 4K Blu-ray player in its own device. Remember back when PlayStation 3 yeah. launched, it was like the Blu-ray player to have, right? And it would help push yeah. the standard onto the market, help sell PlayStations, help sell, uh, you know, higher HDTVs and all that type of stuff. So I'm really maybe shocked that that would be the case. Maybe they're trying to push everybody to their 4K streaming service. <laughs> God, I hope not. Uh, I hope maybe. not either. Um, but, you know, it's just, it's just, it's an odd omission. Um, and it will be interesting to see how this affects the PSVR, which comes out in October, I think October 13th. Um, so we're just over a month away from when the PSVR launches. Um, and, you know, the, that works with the previous PlayStation 4 and with the PS4 Pro. So, like, what the differences will be there. I think they claim either better resolution or, or better frame rates, depending on what, um, you know, I guess the need of the developer is at that particular time. So I, mm -hmm. I, I'm very curious to, to pick one of these up and see kind of what the differences are. And if, the, if a 2X performance delta is enough for general consumers to notice a difference, yeah. right? That, that, that to me is very interesting. The Scorpio is going to be a significant jump over the Xbox One S, like, you know, another multiple yeah. over what this, uh, uh, the PS4 Pro is. So, you know, I mean, you're, you're likely going to thing. see a difference. I mean, Sony, Sony went into great pains to be like, there's not going to be any exclusive 4K content. Everything's going to work on everything, um, which on one hand is good, but on the other hand, you know, are they really, you know, is it, you know, is it, 3.5k 3k ish <laughs> right <laughs> like you know is that yeah. a rude thing to say um, no no it, it, there's there's a whole lot of questions that go with this and again we've never seen this cadence of product releases right. on the console side um so usually when we talk about like console to console compatibility it's like backwards compatibility well this old game work on my new system right um not not the idea of these are all the same platform which is what Sony is pushing with the PS4 and what Xbox will be pushing with the with Scorpio device too. So interesting to see, but I, I'm I'm glad. Like I, the more improvements we see in the console space in terms of hardware, I think the faster you'll see things change uh, software wise in the PC side. So I'm all mm -hmm. for it, just as long as they can keep selling them. I guess he's all for it, people. You heard yeah. it here first. 
Oh, my goodness. And I just want to say PlayStation VR has so much potential. Just wanted to say that. Yep. Oh, uh, software update is going to bring HDR support to all PlayStation 4s. Um, but the Pro doesn't have a Blu-ray player. It doesn't have a 4K Blu-ray. It has Blu-ray. Oh. But it doesn't have the 4K Blu-ray player. I find it difficult to believe that they wouldn't put UHD. I, I agree. I, I agree. <laughs> I don't know. I, I... Now yeah. that I now that I and, and actually honestly I didn't even realize the Xbox One S had a 4K Blu-ray player in it. Now yeah. I'm actually going to take it home and install it. I'm probably going to stop at Best Buy on the way home and pick up <laughs> HD Blu-ray. Uh, I don't know ones. which one to get, but uh, I got to pick. I got to pick something. <laughs> pick something. Um, I think all the Avenger movies are out on uh, Blu-ray. Yeah. Those are always good. X-Men Apocalypse. Yeah, that's just. Mm. Yeah, it just seems like an unfortunate decision. Yep, agreed. Angry Birds movie, 4K <laughs> UHD Blu-ray. That's the one. That's that's what I'm going to pick. I'm going to go get the Angry Birds movie and test well, out my 4K Blu-ray it's player. A, it's, I mean, I, I got to say, <laughs> you know, Robert and I have been talking about the UHD releases on uh, on AVXL, and we've been laughing because it's like, okay, the Angry Birds movie is on 4K you know, UHD Blu-ray, The Huntsman, yeah. Lucy, which I actually really enjoyed. Uh, now You See Me 2 on UHD, Snow Might and The Huntsman on UHD. Mm -hmm. um, Warcraft uh, Oblivion. movie. I kind of liked Oblivion. Uh, you know, I don't know if I like it enough to spend 40 bucks on the Blu-ray for it. Oh, yep. there's a 4K Blu-ray 30th anniversary edition of Labyrinth. Okay, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah I don't now think you, I want that to be my movie. first one. <laughs> Yeah, not 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 buying into it, huh? Oh, wow. I want something that's like new and crisp and sharp, right? <laughs> that's what I want. I don't know. We'll Haters see. gonna hate, man. Well, you know, there's that that uh, <laughs> I can't say it with a straight face. The Angry Birds movie. Um, it will be very crisp. <laughs> Tarzan. Tarzan's yeah. available. Oh, Crouching Tiger, you Hidden Dragon. I haven't seen Captain America Civil War. Maybe that will be the one. That seems Maybe like that would be the one. X-Men yeah. Apocalypse? Civil yeah, War is on pre-order. Oh, is it? Uh, okay. Online Damn. so far. Damn. So, yeah. Well, how about the most, okay, the most popular 4K movies on Blu-ray.com. Deadpool, X-Men Apocalypse. Excuse me, Angry Birds, X-Men Apocalypse, Deadpool, Huntsman, Labyrinth, The Revenant. Uh, probably not something you're going to enjoy. Uh, you're certainly not going to watch it a second time. See, I would get like, I would get <laughs> like IMAX, IMAX Extreme Adventure Collection 4K. Uh, which is pretty good. I've also, uh, having been trapped in a room with Robert Heron doing, uh, UHD television <laughs> testing, Mad Max Fury Road 4K. It's very yeah. nice. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, you know, the Star Trek movies, uh, the, the are on, uh, the Star Trek movies are on 4K. The Watchmen. Uh, is on 4K now, UHD 4K, The Martian. Um, I'll stop now. All right, yeah. I can just I can do this all day long. <laughs> Fitbit, uh, and that's the Flex 2 and the Flex Charge 2 at IFA. Um, Flex 2 now uses four color LEDs, not a display. Uh, it will send notifications to your smartphone. The Charge 2, they've quintupled the size of the display, and the uh, Pure Pulse heart monitoring is standard. There's basically like one model of the of the Charge 2. There's not multiple charge models, um, and, you know, and the usual activity tracking and stuff. Um, and uh, a bunch of mid-range phones were announced at IFA, but we're not going to get into those right now, unless you wail on us and say we have to we have to cover those in which case we will nice. um aces zen watch samsung gear s3 uh it's an odd choice with the with the gear s3 um because they did uh a classic and a frontier version you know and mm -hmm. you know samsung tizen based wearable os 2.3.2 .2. they're claiming four days of battery life which seems kind of incredible uh, you know i do really like the whole twisting the bezel control their ip68 waterproof um they use standard 22 uh, millimeter watch mm -hmm. bands which is great if you don't want to pay like 50 dollars for a two dollar watch band <coughs> apple um you know but it's funny like they're pitching the frontier for active folks but it's not like it's a bigger watch it's the exact same watch uh, with the exact same dual core one gigahertz processor, like, you know, 768 megabytes of RAM, four gigs of storage. Uh, but in some countries, the Frontier will get uh, LD, uh, uh, LTE 3G. Um, 
Okay. But I thought it was kind of odd that they had these two watches with the same spec. Uh, and Asus announced the Zen Watch 3, which sounds interesting, except there's like almost no specs other than it's Android Wear and it's cold forged steel that's 82% stronger than their stainless competitors. So, you know, if you think you're going to be, you know, trapped in the wilderness hammering in tent pegs with your smartwatch uh, before it runs out of battery life, you may want to take a closer look at the Asus Zen Watch 3. Yeah. Mm. You have a car, right? <laughs> I do. I do. I drive a car. You do? You drive a car? Yeah. Cars are good. If you've been uh, wondering how to take advantage of that OBD2 jack that's hidden, you may have never even seen it, but your car has one of his built after 1996. And I'm bringing that up because this episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by Automatic. It's a little adapter, a small adapter that turns your clunker into a smarter connected car. Automatic has just launched Automatic Pro, their new unlimited 3G car adapter with no monthly fees or subscription. Always there. 3G lets you know where your vehicle is parked at any time or lets you track your vehicle even if you're not with it. Children. Uh, children driving new drivers. It uh, works with If This Then That for endless customization, uh, connecting your car to the rest of your life. And you can easily file business expenses with popular apps like Concur and Expensify. You can even link your car to a Nest thermostat or Amazon Echo. Imagine it, Alexa, where did I park my car? Yeah, you can do that. Sounds good, doesn't it? You can get human help in a crash, too. Automatic Pro detects severe accidents, and trained responders call for help when you can't. <laughs> Automatic works on nearly every car made after 1996. It takes just minutes to connect your car to your iPhone or Android device via Bluetooth. It even integrates with Apple Watch and Pebble. So if you haven't played around uh, with an automatic in your car, you might want to think about it. Uh, it's, it's interesting stuff. Uh, and I'm kind of fascinated by the fact that you can now integrate it with Hue or Nest or Amazon Echo uh, and start you know, linking it to your automated home. Yeah. Automatic Pro is normally $129.95, but when you use our exclusive offer code TWIT, that's T-W-I-T, you'll save 20 bucks. Visit automatic.com slash TWIT for more information. Use the offer code TWIT to save $20 off on the regular purchase price. That's automatic.com slash TWIT. We want to thank them for their support of This Week in Computer Hardware. Definitely. So you may remember that we usually talk about computer hardware somewhere in the show. Uh, this has obviously been a mobile and console heavy show, yep. and some of you have probably been staring at your MP3 player and your dashboard. Remember MP3 players? Those are going to be big. <laughs> Those are going to be really Diamond Rio. Diamond Rio uh, is the one to get. Well, I've got an Astell and Kern and a Fio uh, dedicated uh, audio player stuffed full of FLAC files. They both support HD audio, uh, uh, you know, in my bag over here. So I am ready to be able to use my awesome headphones in a world that no longer has headphone jacks. Um, but uh, bringing it back to computers, because this is a show about computer uh, hardware, uh, this week in computer hardware, uh, you got uh, Geekbench leaked results, uh, and they have extrapolated AMD's Zen performance. And this is a big deal. If you missed uh, us talking about it a couple weeks ago, AMD, Zen processors, scooching back towards Intel's level of CPU performance. What's the word, man? So, yeah, if you remember back uh, a couple weeks ago, AMD showed a basically a single benchmark running Blender, and they, they were basically running uh, a Broadwell 8-core processor and a Zen 8-core processor, and they were basically matched in performance. They were trying to demonstrate the IPC improvements that they've made. Um, so what happened was, is over the holiday weekend here in the U.S., a, a Geekbench score kind of leaked out. A Geekbench kind of just kind out. of... It, well, so like, it leaked out. Pregnant? It's a... <laughs> Yeah, explaining that to your parents, right? Uh, <laughs> it's a, a syn pregnant, Mom. synthetic tests that run through a bunch of different different algorithms for different things, for compression, for encryption, um, image manipulation, whatever, uh, and it generates kind of scores, right? And it, they released a result that had uh, a single per single core and multi core performance, uh, but it was only running at one point four four gigahertz, so very low, you know, early prototype. Uh, processor being run and because of the complication of you don't know if this this was a two socket system is the communication between the two processors running at full speed there's a lot of question marks that come into that um, so I really just looked at th single threaded results and then right. um, what I wanted to do was obviously 1.44 gigahertz is pretty low so we basically assumed perfect scaling on performance and did a multiply to get up to 3.6 gigahertz. And then, you know, you look at the score. So if you look at these benchmark graphs on, on the story at PCPro.com, you'll see three lines. The light green line in the middle is the actual score from, from uh, Geekbench for the 1.44 gigahertz Zen part. 
And then the dark green part is the extrapolated result at 3.6 gigahertz. And there are some, you know, issues with that when you go into the second graph where there's some memory results that obviously won't scale that well. The blue sure. line is another Geekbench result for a Xeon processor uh, that runs at 3.6 gigahertz. Interestingly enough, this is an Ivy Bridge architecture. So it's a little bit older in terms of the Intel architecture that we're looking at, right? Because it goes Ivy Bridge, then Haswell, Broadwell, Skylake, right? So right. There, there are some more IPC improvements that happen that way. And what you'll see is out of maybe 16, 20 tests, um, there are two uh, where the AMD processor legitimately looks like it will have better performance than the Xeon processor. Um, cool. That being said, there, the rest of them show anywhere from, uh, the, the Zen processor is running anywhere from 70 to 85% of the performance of the Ivy Bridge processor, which is, uh, you know, better than they've ever been able to do in the past probably, but not equal performance, right? It's not matching IPC uh, to the, the most, even, even to a, you know, several year old Intel architecture. Um, right. So it leaves us with, with some questions, right? Are the numbers accurate? Is our extrapolation accurate? And, and, and for single threaded performance, multi, you know, multiplying by that frequency difference is a, is a very reliable way to kind of guess performance mm -hmm. scaling. Um, that being said, there could be other things that are holding back AMD's processors. Maybe uh, the the motherboard uh, that the processor is running on wasn't fully cache aware. Maybe it was missing out on some of that type of stuff. Um, but if not, if this is what to expect, then it stands to reason that AMD's Zen processor could be at a significant disadvantage over, you know, where we'll be at Skylake and Broadwell E will be the target uh, uh, competition against Zen when it comes out in the first quarter of next year. And that's going to be interesting, right? Um, right. AMD kind of set the expectation with that blender test of we're going to be on equal footing. Uh, and it can't be, the answer can't be that we're only on equal footing with this one particular workload. It has to be over <laughs> a general... Could be the first time that's been done. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, and, and, you know, when they, show, when, when they show one benchmark, you always take it as a grain of salt. And we did that at the time. Uh, and But it was really early in the development process. You never really know how things are going to work out. Um, but if these results are accurate and if kind of our estimations are even close, um, they have the potential to be still 30 to 40% behind Skylake's IPC uh, when it comes out. And, and to note, if these Zen numbers held up, the... Zen processor would have to run at about 4.8 gigahertz to match the IPC of the 3.6 gigahertz Xeon Ivy Bridge part. So, and that's going to be yeah. a, a tough thing to do, right? 4.8 gigahertz, probably not something that's going to be achievable. I mean, maybe it will. I don't know uh, what the process technology will be like and what the architecture actually allows. But that would be a tough nut to crack, if you will, to get to 4.8 gigahertz to have to match that. So... There, there's, again, take all of this kind of discussion with grain of salt. Um, this is nowhere near finalized. We have a lot of time between now and we have a lot of time between now and November or D uh, January for things to change. Mm -hmm. But we don't have so much time that if these numbers are close to accurate, that I feel like AMD would actually be able to like turn a switch and, and make everything catch up. So right. uh, it'll be interesting to see how, you know, if we start to see parts. Uh, you know, leak out in the December time frame, um, what we'll be able to to show from it. I don't know. Me neither. I'm very yep. curious, though. Do you think AMD is going to be, you know, talking about this at CES or? Yeah, I think for sure they'll have to, right? If not right. before that, right? They, they've, their original target was was the end of 2016. And I think their goal is still maybe to like, just kind of like leak out re reviews maybe before CES uh, right. and maybe like a handful of system builders will be able to build a handful of parts based on it just so they can say they made that Q4 2016 mark. Um, but the I think the big push will be, you know, February, March timeframe of uh, 2017. Hmm. 
Oh, my goodness. Uh, we talked about uh, a bunch of the more high-profile laptops that came out of IFA. Um, you have the, the Yoga 2-in-1, uh, which I can't wait to get a real-world test. I, I've, I've had a chance to be hands-on and, and type on it uh, on a couple different occasions, and the Halo keyboard is actually really impressive. Uh, we talked about the uh, Acer's crazy 21-inch curved laptop, 18-pound, excuse me, 17-pound lunchbox. Um, but uh, we had another Cobby Lake update. Uh, Razer updated the Blade and Blade Stealth laptops uh, with Cobby Lake. Um, so the uh, the uh, regular model uh, uh, does Skylake and an NVIDIA GTX 1060. The Stealth uh, uh, is using the onboard Intel HD Graphics 620 instead of a discrete part. Um, so that's uh, pretty much what we've, we've seen for most other vendors. Um, where it's, you know, it's, it's the TDP is compatible uh, and it uses the existing chipset as the Skylake. So just dropping in a new chip and going. Uh, and the core, uh, what I like to think of as the lunchbox, is still running at uh, uh, $500 and you provide your own GPU mm -hmm. on that. Um, Logitech G Prodigy mice keyboard and headset uh, are targeting gamers who don't want to spend all of the money. Uh, this is actually the G213 Prodigy I'm holding right here. Um, and uh, it's a nice keyboard. Um, it is a membrane keyboard. You can't really see it, but you'll notice the LEDs changing color. Uh, you can do all of the LEDs. Uh, you can do a sweep across the LEDs. You cannot individually program LEDs like we've seen on the mechanical chip keyboards. Um, I'm actually ordering. There's a inexpensive $30 keyboard uh, mouse combo uh, that's very popular on Amazon that's for gamers um, where it's another membrane keyboard. I want to compare that because, you know, this seems like, you know, I like the button designs. Uh, you know, I like the fact that there's a built-in, uh, uh, you know, there's, there's a, a built-in wrist rest on this, but it seems, you know, expensive for a membrane keyboard, $70. On the flip side, they also did the... Uh, uh, the G231 Prodigy headset is $70, and the new mice, um, which they do a wireless and a uh, wired version. And I got to say, the I really like the mice. They're super simple. They reduce the number of buttons on them to make them somewhat more human-friendly. And those yeah. are selling for $70 or $69.99 a piece, too. Uh, you guys did a full mm -hmm. review on those. Um, you actually no, did not, up on not that. A full, oh, not a full okay. review yet, but I, I basically just got them in right before we left for the for a holiday the holiday weekend as well. Right. And I spent you know 30 or 40 minutes with them. It seemed like... Yeah really good devices. I actually really like the feel of the mouse. They, you know, they mentioned that they kind of were going through that Intellimouse design yeah. and feel. Um, I think that was a smart choice. There's a, you know, and also yeah. I got to say the there's a, a 10 gram weight uh, and you basically press in here and this little plastic lid is also the carrier for the weight uh, and snaps into place. And I should point out the, uh, the G403 wired version is $69. The wireless version is $99. So, um, yeah, I like the mouse a lot more than I like the keyboard. The mouse I found really compelling. The keyboard, possibly because I've spent so much time on mechanical uh, mm. uh, keyboards, is is not nearly as fantastic to me. Uh, and the headset, the headset actually seems uh, the G two G two thirty one headset seems really mm. nice too. Not wireless, um, but decent quality and uh, uh, makes it easy to you know they've set it up so you can bounce between your play your your PlayStation, your Xbox, and your PC. Um, right, it's analog, not know. USB. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's definitely better audio quality than the pre the, the two generations previous Logitech headsets like the G930 and stuff. Um, probably not the same drivers that you see in the G933 or the G633. Right. Uh, obviously for for cost reasons, but it's but it's it's right. it sounds pretty good. It's a little bit bass heavy, based on my first listen to of it, <laughs> uh, which is pretty common in uh, you know gaming, gaming headsets. headsets. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, but again, another $69 product. But the mouse, the wired mouse, the keyboard, and the headset are all $69, bucks, um, which is pretty reasonable. It's not as dirt cheap as like the $30 monoprice or whatever sure. that you can buy. Um, so but I'm, I'm curious to see you know, kind of what the comparisons are like. Yeah. I, I Like I said, I'm going to order one of those inexpensive membrane keyboards uh, that, that are sort of a brand you never heard of, but 23000 Incredibly positive reviews on uh, on Amazon. Uh, mm. Another thing uh, Logitech released uh, a little bit earlier this summer is the Pop Home Switch. Uh, I reviewed that uh, on Tech Thing this week, and I've kind of mm. fell in love with this. Um, so, if you're, you know, one of the challenges of home automation or Internet of Things or whatever we're going to call it this week is that you often end up with multiple apps on your phone. 
uh, or, you know, awkwardly integrated uh, services on your phone. Or if somebody wants to come to your house, uh, you either have to help them hook up to your stuff or you have to have like, oh, there's a tablet we keep so people can operate all of our crazy home automated stuff, whether it's the blinds or the lights. And, and uh, uh, I dream of, of sure. wireless motorized blinds. Uh, they are not inexpensive by my standards, but soon, soon there will be some that are affordable and I will put them all over my house. Um, but it's pretty crazy. Um, the pop home switch, uh, comes with two of these switches and it comes with a, uh, basically a Wi-Fi adapter. You plug the Wi-Fi adapter in the center of your house, um, load an app onto your phone, or I should say load an app onto your phone with a standard Logi, uh, uh, Logi log on, uh, like you would use uh, to do a Harmony remote. Um, mm -hmm. You plug this in, you hit a button on this, and there's three commands. There's one click, there's two clicks, and there's holding it down. And that allows you to do three different recipes, um, which can include... Um, you know, uh, uh, you know, light bulbs from several manufacturers. You can do, you can set it up so like I can walk into my house, click a button, the lights go on in the living room, the Sonos goes on all over the house playing my favorite playlist. Uh, you can use it to cue like I want to watch movies. I click twice and it does the entire uh, 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 configuration from a Harmony remote, for example. Uh, I read somebody's review on it where they had it set up so they have wireless control over the air conditioning uh, and their Sonos, like, and their lights. So they would, like, it's time for bed, and they would hold the button down, and it would fire up the AC in their bedroom, you know, trim the lights right. to the level they wanted and do all that other stuff. I just like it because it allows you to do things like, oh, you know, I need to control these blinds in this room when the babysitter's here, or I want to turn on every light in the house, or I want to, and you can do it without having to be like, my phone, I log into my phone, I go to the app, I wait for the app to open. Um, right. if, you know, it's amazing how nice it is to just click once, twice, or three times, and you throw up one of those recipes. Mm. I was I was really impressed. Not particularly inexpensive at ninety nine dollars, um, but they're expecting five years of battery life out of these, uh, and the build quality looks pretty good. They have the uh, you know a whole bunch of colors, uh, so you can have like different colors matching to your room. The batteries are replaceable. Uh, you know, without using, uh, you know, an iFixit menu and several right. hours of, of spudgers and stuff. Um, good stuff. Um, one last thought before we go, Logi or Logitech. Uh, um, Samsung has responded to the Galaxy Note 7 issue. Um, man, uh, <laughs> 35 reported cases of defective Galaxy Note 7 batteries. Um Basically, when they say defective, uh, Scott wrote this up, and I thought it was very gracious of him to say defective. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you know, batteries bursting into flames definitely would be considered effective, or excuse me, defective. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, as of September 1, 35 cases have been reported globally. Uh, they're going through their suppliers trying to figure out... Uh, you know, what happened to the batteries and, and what batteries are in the market. Uh, but they have stopped sales on the Galaxy Note 7, and they will voluntarily replace your device with a new one over the coming weeks. So they haven't done a full, like, Super Product Safety Commission uh, recall, uh, but they're blasting it out over the universe. That, hey, we got to replace this. We got, we got a problem here. So, uh, yeah, Sweet. catching fire or exploding. So 35 cases confirmed. So or 35 complaints uh, have been confirmed. So we don't really uh, we don't really know too much more about what's going on. So oh my goodness. So yeah, if you have a Galaxy Note 7, you might not want to charge it in one of the more flammable or carry it around in a more flammable pocket. Um, not a ton of information around them. What's happening on that? But uh, yeah. It's a pretty dramatic. Explosion. Yeah. <laughs> it will cost us so much it makes my heart ache, President Ko Dong Jin says. Uh, he would be the president of Samsung. Yeah. Heart's aching, and uh, Samsung's heart aches, and Apple has courage. Um, oh, my goodness. 2.5 million Note 7s have already been sold globally. Estimated about 24 out of 1 million units may have a faulty battery guessing that's a supplier that they're not going to use in the future so probably not yeah i don't know and and i, I will say uh teasing aside props to samsung for stepping up and being like we're replacing them all uh mr ko says quote there was a tiny problem in the manufacturing process so it was very difficult to figure out 
So it's it's what the complicated part for that is like, how do you replace somebody's phone? Like, I mean, you've got to tell them to stop using it and send it in. And then yeah. what phone do they use in the interim? Right. Most people don't have just extra smartphones sitting around. Right. Uh, and the complication of moving between phones, like you just moved to that phone, uh, got your app set up, got all your contacts set up and did all the things you need to do. Sounds like a pain in the ass. So yeah. I don't know. If, if I had one of those phones, I would probably take the risk and hold on to it until they had a replacement ready. <laughs> I'm sure a lot um, of people are. Yeah. It's only you know, 24 in a million, man. What's the worst you can do? Yeah, oh, I mean, the chances are. South Korean high school teacher Park Soo Jin says the star.com said she'd rushed to buy the new phone, pre-ordering and then activating it on August 19th. It's official launch date. The 34-year-old living in the port city of Busan said that she was bruised when she rushed out of her bed after her phone burst into flames, filling her bedroom with smoke stinking of chemicals. She's having second thoughts about buying another newly released drive, excuse me, newly released device, especially after losing all her personal data stored in the destroyed Note 7. Which brings us back to one of my favorite things to say anywhere I go, back up your data. And if you haven't lately, back up your phone, just in case it bursts into flames tonight. <laughs> Sleep Good well. Point. Good point. <laughs> oh, my goodness. On that cheerful note, PCPro.com is a place to find Mr. Ryan Shrout, who is recovering from an excess of news this week, much like I am. You can find me at techthing.com or avxl.com, at Ryan Shrout or at Patrick Norton on Twitter. We want to thank you for listening to This Week in Computer Hardware. You can find more episodes of This Week in Computer Hardware at twit.tv slash T-W-I-C-H. We'd love it if you subscribed so you would make sure you got every single episode. Just use your favorite podcatcher. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Patrick Norton. I'm Ryan Shrout. We'll see you next week on Twitch.